Okay, welcome to the BTM Club In Conversation series. Today we have a UK reggae legend, I have to say that, because his background was initially in Black Slate. We've spoken to him before at the BTM Club. He came into the beat to have a conversation with his last release. Um, but now Mr. Man has got, as they say, big things going on. We have Anthony Brightly. How are you? Oh, it's an absolute pleasure to be with you again, Barry. Nice um, to see you. Look at you looking all lean. Well, you know, you're already, you know, as we get older, we have to look after ourselves and make sure that... Yeah, we do, we but I'm here now looking like a Christmas pudding. <laughs> you're making me feel guilty. I've got to get back to my running. <laughs> you got to, at least it's a sweet Christmas pudding. You see it. <laughs> We need to compare chip up and everything. Yeah, you know, this is serious thing. We we you serious thing, mister. Come on. So how are you? How is life in Antigua? Antigua is beautiful. Um I can't you know, I can't complain. It definitely. is one of my favorite islands, definitely. Well, you need to come back again and come to the bottom. Oh yes, up. I do. I do need to come back. Jazzy B needs to take me back out there. <laughs> he needs to, to start back to life again and take me back out there. That. I hear that. Imagine you were that back to life. You never know me then. What? Well, I knew you. there were your speaker boxes that we were using. <laughs> oh, right. oh, you really know what was going on? Okay. I know what was going on. Trust me. <laughs> yeah, that was a great thing. Because I can remember the boys coming, H coming and Pops That's coming right. to get the, the speakers from you. And looking at me, asking me, can I help? I don't think so. I'm on holiday. I don't even do boxes in London. Never did box boy in London. I haven't come to Antigua to do box boy. I'm sorry. But anyway, that's the whole life. You're making, mate. You're part of that history. No, I, I didn't miss it. Trust me. I saw it. But I knew I didn't need to get involved in it. You know? Okay, all right. You know, humping speakers. Come on, look at my hands. You can see these are not working hands like that kind of work. You know what I'm saying? All right. I yeah, that was quite a thing, though. Back to life with Roddy and Trevor Nelson and Norman J. Soul to soul, it was a great time. Those, I think, three years I went. But yeah, but um, did all of them. <laughs> oh, yeah, literally, yes, absolutely. Um, so how have you been? All right, so I've been very busy, but um, nicely busy. Yeah, because doing this movie, well, it's actually a sequel. But being able to do to start it off with this short movie, which introduces all, which is the basis for the sequels, is right? In times. Okay, so tell me, we know your history really is in Black Slate mm -hmm. and the stardom that you got globally with Black Slate. Yeah, because we spoke about that on our last interview, but now this is really about the transition. Well, yeah, I mean, it's still about music, but now to movie maker, producer, director. How did all of this come about? Well, you know what? It's something, because I used to do TV shows before. So in the oh. 90s, I, did, I had a show called Upstart. I also had a thing called the, um, the Video Club, the um, live video club. Right. And I also had the Reggae Chart Show. So, so I where all... were these shows aired? All in Hackney. Well, they were at the time they were all in, in Hackney. Right. And um Oasis Club, Pegasus Club, Chimes Club, um, Prohibition in the West End. So I used nightclubs as the basis and um, right. because obviously we had the setting. And in everything I do, I've always used sound system and DJs to be the as captain. the basis. Yeah. Yeah, and, um, and just use pick up the different personalities out of the music scene to see if they can cross over. So I use Dub Bug, Mystery, Angie Greaves, and um, and now we're using DJ Lane. So yeah, it's 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 very exciting times where we have these. So what role is DJ Elaine playing in this? Well, DJ Lane is going to be the host. And she's okay. The She's the hosting the whole. Um, she's hosting the whole evening at the prem at the film premiere. Right. 
Okay. And, um, and she's done one of the first main interviews, which breaks everything down. So DJ Lane is playing actually a major role in, um, in the whole, as DJ Lane, the personality herself. Right. And, um, and then incorporating, like, we have Super D. I don't know if you've heard of Super D. No. He's a young DJ. Right. Um, Heartless Crew. Okay. The DJ Corey and Depths and Lord, which represents the five years, I mean, the five generations okay. of British black music DJs. Right. Um, you've got Sir George as part of the first set of British black DJs coming right up to as young as Debs and Lord. Because oh, Sir George dad. was your sound system, right? Right. So George is my dad. Right. Okay. And um, so I took it over from my dad at the age of 14, well, 13. Right. And, um, which is why I started to make the doublet, which is how Six Man came along. Right. And that is really the catalyst of the, of, and that's why the movie is called The Six Man Record. <laughs> Why right. was the Six Man record made? What was so important about the Six Man? Why I should use that as a title? Now, we had a brief conversation the other day because you were coming from meetings and I was coming from meetings and you were rushing, I was rushing, and you were leaving back to go back to Antigua the next day. And you gave me a, a description of Six Man that to me was different from what I had known. That's right. You know, and what we, all the songs that we'd heard, Sticks Man, Sticks Man Affair, it was, a Sticks Man was a thief. Yeah. But you gave me a different twist on it. So let's hear that. Okay. So the original Sticks Man in Hackney right. were the first generation of the young boys who came from the Caribbean. Right. Came to England. Right. Now, the problem that they had was, they were so bright, I would say 90% of them was brighter than everybody, every class they went in. But because they were black and these teachers didn't even know how to deal with them, they were put in the back of the class, but they were far from stupid. So they could read better than the average boy in the class or girl in the class. They could write English better, full stop, because yeah. they knew proper, English grammar because grammar, they were taught it. That's and right. Yeah, that's definitely true. From a foreigner, you then do it properly because you can't, you have to do it right or wrong. So in the Caribbean, they were taught how to do English properly. Now they come to England, fast forward, six, seven, eight, nine, put into these schools where they, they're the only ones in the class, or there might be two or three if they're lucky, and um, go through the schooling system without being able to take exams because they were, they were called names and looked on and scorned upon because they were black. So these guys quite militantly decided that they're not going to work in the hospitals. They are not doing what their parents are doing. Not to say they're disrespecting their parents, but they knew there were more to them, that, more about them than that. Okay. And, um, and this is the amazing thing about it. These groups of people congregated in the Lambeth area, the Southwark area, the Hackney area, Haringey, and the Brent. Those are because those were the five hotspot boroughs where most of the black people went to. Right. And the amazing thing about it, in every area, you had these young people opening shops, providing goods for younger, for shops that were struggling. So you had the big people, black shops, struggling because they wasn't getting the, the discount like the white green grocers were getting or like the from the different supermarkets, the different cash and carries. And I say that because I... My parents experienced that because my parents had a grocery shop and my dad used to go to the market and they were just charging more than everyone else. So what happened as a result, these guys went around, did what they did and sold their products 
slightly cheaper and undercut or provided shopkeepers with products so they could be competitive. Okay. Now, this started in 74. Right. Before, Before my time, of course. No, not really. Of course. Well, <laughs> we were very young people. Yeah. 73, 74, 75, these guys were hitting the road and they were saying, we are, basically, we're going to show you a SARS. <laughs> right? Okay. And as a result, without even realizing, these guys from all these different eras was just going out into the rich neighborhoods, dressing up very formal, and basically taking from the rich and helping the poor. Okay. Now, that went on. And when it, it was discovered, because obviously it, it, it happened simultaneously, so as a result, um, a crime scene was created and a, cri a squad was created to find these people. And um, it leaded on into 76. And when we got into 76 now, you had another generation which were the kids who were born in England doing the same thing, but they wasn't doing it to help. <laughs> right. Just, so the, the so six so. man reputation then, you would say is attributed to the second generation that were born here, that, were, right. that took the name, but didn't take the principle. Right. But they, they, but they, but they had another principle attached to it. Because what it was, again, they said, I know I'm bright. I know I, I can do better than the guy I went to school in or the girl I went to school. But they won't give me a job. So they were going out for jobs. Right. Being a clerical assistant, working in an office. And they couldn't get, no, the only jobs they were offered was either working in Marks and Spencer's, Woolworths, any of the department stores, or in a factory. And they said, we're not doing this. Okay. And as a result, again, with knowing or being aware of these little camps that was around, um, the criteria you had to dress a certain way and you would go out. And you still, those guys were still paying subs. So they were still paying in to, because they were, they were all groups. So they were still like an call it organized crime then. Right. Yeah, no, because that's, that's what it really sounds like. Um, yeah. Because how you initially explain it, the principle of what the first lot of sticks men were doing, you could almost say it's a, a Robin Hood Absolutely. syndrome. That's right. You're taking from them to give to other people, but it doesn't sound like the next generation were doing that. The, the, what I would say for the next generation was they did it, well, what they didn't do, they didn't floss and drink champagne and carry on like they were better than everyone else. But well, what they did do was obviously have a principle and have a, and a direction. So some of them said, I'm not going to do this all the time, but I'm going to do this until I can do my own business or do this. Or... And a lot of these guys who did it, in, um, who was 17, 18, 19, by the time they got to 21, they went back to college. And by the time they became 80, um, by 85, they were all getting decent jobs. And by 85, local black guys and girls were getting now um, jobs in the council. Okay. And it wasn't just the one and two. You were getting jobs working in the council because the council realized if they wanted to be efficient, that uh, they had to, um, they would have to employ black people. So they found that in the 60s, 70s, our black people were very much this domestic, but they were domestic, they did domestic, but made the era that they're working be very up to standard and up to scratch. So the nurses, the domestic staff in the hospitals, they made the hospital run like proper hospitals. Do you, you yeah. know what I mean? Don't mess with a bus conductor. He took it serious. So they <laughs> found, Indeed. once black people was working for them, they became more efficient. So the public transportation became more efficient. 
the hospitals became inefficient. And then when the black people started to work in the, in the council, the council started to become more efficient. So when you watch the trend of what black people had to do in order to get in, they had to kick the doors down. And that's the part no one, that's the history that nobody knows. Because when they kicked the door down and got in their job, they were then threatened to say, if you don't maintain or keep yourself quiet and don't talk to other black people, you're going to lose your job. And that's why the, the, the last set of segregation started in the workplace because by this time, people have got mortgages now. They can't afford to lose their jobs. So all of a sudden, people are protecting their livelihood. Whereas when they first got in, it was each one teach one, bring one in, you can do this. And then the powers that be just alter that. So the main reason for doing this is to make people understand our history. And with every film I do, there is a book and there's a textbook that kids can read, do lessons with from infants right up to um, university level. So hopefully okay. the next five years, we could have a course called Black British History. And a man can get a degree in that. Or a master's or a doctor. So how detailed is the book? The, deta- the book will be as detailed as the film. So it will give you the full overrun of the film, what it's about. But right. it will give you the background of each area. And depending, you know I mean, for example, it will talk about what is a CSC? Or what's the difference yeah. between a CSC and an O-level? Why was it invented? And those are the things we're going to put in the book so that people realize, oh, so when they said that they were going to make all schools com- comprehensive and make everyone equal, they didn't because they made some schools do O level that was in certain areas. And then some schools did CSEs, which meant that once you came out of school, you had to go back to college again and do another two years. So you were always two years behind your white counterpart who went to a, um, a school that did all levels. Yeah, yeah. And very strategically done. And, you know, I mean, I talk about it based on experience because when I came out of school, to do English and maths at all level, the work was too hard. So even the CSE level of work did not equip me to be able to study and do the O levels in the college. So it meant that I literally had to relearn. Yeah, so that would have meant then you possibly had to do an O-level, a GCE, in two years as opposed to one. You got it in one. You got it exactly one. Because a a GCE O-level is one year. Um, An A-level is two. So, you know, you're saying basically that with the education that you got, you were so far behind that you were left having to do yeah. what should be one year in two years. Yeah. And okay. if you can imagine being 18 now, discovering this, you, you come out of school, you go to the first college, you realize you can't work, then you go back to re it again. So that's three years out of your life. You get into 20, you're trying to, she just want to survive. So you have to work. Your mom is saying, boy, you need to have a job. You need to have a job. I know you want to go to college, but you need to have a job because your household is under pressure still. Yes, and you know, you know, I, I can get that to a degree because pressure is pressure. You know what I mean? If your household, you need the extra wage. But that mentality actually wasn't very helpful as the parent because that was pushing them into something menial in a hurry rather than encouraging them to go back to their further education, which would then later put them in a different position. But you see, understand with our parents not understanding the schooling level. You know, I mean, a lot of our parents had children who went to America and was graduating and doing all that stuff. But, you know, I mean, 
I used to see my my brothers from Jamaica going to America and doing all the putting on the gowns and graduating. I would say, why am I always wearing them grown for? Because I didn't even understand what it apart from watching University Challenge on TV and them dressing up sometimes in the gown. And it was always white people. So the problem is you never saw yourself in anything where you wanted to go. Right. And okay. when you don't have a role model in an area, you don't have a doctor, you don't have a lawyer, you don't have a policeman, you don't have a nobody as a royal mother. Unlike in the Caribbean, your prime minister is black, your 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 doctor is black, everyone's black. So you can choose who you want to be like or what you want to do because you see it around you. But in England, you went to the doctor, and the, 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 my first doctor was white. My second doctor was Chinese. My third was Indian. I still don't see a black man yet. So come on. Mm. When you're set up and put in a, an environment, you are your environment, you know. Don't, yeah. don't think you can run away from it. They say it takes a, a, a village to raise a child, but the village is going to raise the child based on the environment of that village. Yeah. So why yes, you're absolutely to, right. Why did we all go to clubs? Why did because that's what was in the village. We had the local youth center, we had the local club in our all the clubs them days used to have restaurants. So if our parents were going out for a meal, they would go to the nightclub, have the dinner at the nightclub, and then go and dance afterwards. Right. So that was our environment that we grew up in. And as the years went along, we lost the restaurants in the nightclub. I think the last restaurant that had a nightclub in it was Night Moves. Yeah, yeah. Um, after that, you know, I mean, I, you know, I mean, I did in my clubs, I did um, weddings and things like that, or we might put on a buffet only for a particular night. But you couldn't come out and say, right now, go for a rest. I'm going to Chimes to have a meal, and then I'm going to go and rave the night away. No. You went elsewhere to have a meal, and then you came to church. And, um, and this is why I say how our environment had changed. Yeah. Because you want to go to a nice restaurant, you no longer want to go to All Nations and eat. You don't want to go to Night Moves and eat. You're going to the Chinese restaurant in Oxford Street or didn't because it's what the environment you're in and what you're seeing. Oh, we're going out for a meal. Oh, where you going pizza? Oh, where you going, you know what I mean? Pizza land, you know, I remember when that was a special place or the steakhouse. Mm. And, and that is when our environment started where our wealth stopped circulating in our own environment and started to go out. So it started on the social and then grocery shops like my parents had to close because of all the red routes and they never provide parking. And then they started to, so instead of going to our butchers or our Green grocers and grocers, you start going to Tesco because it's got parking. And then you see the money just leaving the community on every single level. Right. We our own banks, so we wasn't borrowing from ourselves to give ourselves interest. We were borrowing from the, the, the high street banks. We're shopping with the with the Tesco's and the same grid. So the only thing. And now we don't even have any nightclubs. So the only places that actually maintain any kind of black wealth is the barbershop or the hairdressers. Okay. Yeah. So it's only one. Whereas before, you did your hair, you did your nails, you buy your food, you, you, you go to entertainment. You might be renting from a black man. So the money stayed. Yeah. But no, you know what I mean? From the council side to provide housing, everybody moved on to the black people holes and started to live in council housing. That was a third of you, that's a third of your income gone and out of the black community. Mm. So unless you left that house and bought a house, you were then we're putting the hands, the money in the hands of somebody else. Right. And that's the kind of history that we're not taught about 
you know what I mean? Why did the black community or the Caribbean community, why did they not rise or why did they not become financially viable or why, why, why? So, well, there's reasons. It's not that we never earn any money. We earn good money, but we were mm. sort of able to spend it with each other. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But back to the books. You said that you've got the books and they're at all levels from kindergarten to middle school, secondary to adult education. And you said they're quite detailed. So has it been accepted in the curriculum? No. Um, so we did one book before. We tried to get it. We've got it to some libraries. And but no schools actually recognize it. It's right. 60 short stories of Caribbean families. But you know, you like with anything, if we do enough of them, yeah. Know, I, I'm not worried. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not worried at all. You know, there are something there's things we do that will just when our time come, our time comes. It's as simple as yeah, that. yeah, absolutely. Keep on pressing the button. So on to the movie. Yeah. Let's hear about the movie. So the movie Six Man, which is the Anthony Brightly record, is based on coming out of school. I have two sets of friends. I have my schoolmates who are in my sound system that I've taken that I've inherited from my father. And right. then I have another set of friends who are in black slate, who I've met from since I started school. So they're all like five, six years older than me. Right. So I'm this baby in the group, and I am the in the sound. I am like on par with my with my fellow friends, and okay. it shows us discovering what we're gonna do when we come out of school. So we talk about what we're gonna do, and what our choices are. Then at the same time, we're trying to establish ourselves as a sound system. And um, and discovering what works and what doesn't work, you know, in learning how to select properly, playing the records at the right time. So right. there's a little dialogue about how do you become a good sound system. Um, and there's a little dialogue where we we introduce and we talk about the making of the six record and the reason for making it. So you see the family. So basically, you see all aspects. So you see the family, you see, and it's basically my story. So you see with me, with my school friends, with the group, you see me trying to enter the world of the record business. Right. Not acknowledging that actually you're too young. No one does this at the age of 15, 16. So why are you trying to do this? So you, you're technically forthright doing things that, 20 odd year old people do. So I go to the so record. Basically, this is your specific story. It's not just a story in general. No, no, it's a true to life story. Right. Okay. I thought it was, you know, telling a story generally of what was happening at the time. I didn't know it was actually specifically your story. It's my story of what was happening at the time. Right, right. <laughs> so it's what was going on at the time. Yeah, yeah. And um, and I'm in the midst of it, and how I navigated myself around it. Yeah. Well, as I said, yours is a specific story about you. It's your story, what you were doing at the time, what was going on at the time. Whereas, you know, it can be compared to Steve McQueen's Lovers Rock, but that wasn't about anyone or anything specific. It was just about a generalized picture of what was happening at the time. Yeah, from the eyes of a four-year-old. Right. Yeah, yeah. And that's what he said. He remembers it as a four-year-old, yeah. not yeah. as a big man. So that was actually participating in the shabins and the blues and the right. yeah, 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 yeah. So he was able because I I watched his interview, and he said he was that child laying on the bed with all the coats being thrown on him. Yeah, Once yeah. he said that, everyone like us can understand that. Yeah, yeah. Because that was that room upstairs, that young man. Oh, put your coat upstairs. Put your coat upstairs. Yeah. And you don't realize this baby sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that was definitely a very real part of 
of some people's journey for sure. Yeah. So when you hear him say that, it, it, you know, I mean, all is forgiven, Steve. <laughs> yeah, and I think that is this slightly later generation because our generation of parents. They didn't take you to any party and just leave you in the bedroom. No. They just didn't do that. Do you know what I mean? Our parents' right. generation, they just didn't do that. You were coming to the party with them and you were with them. If they couldn't bring you, they weren't going. Well, that was my experience. Yeah, so with our generation, we had our parents at home. So if we had young children, yeah. mom, can you look after? Or daddy, can you look after? So you had babysitters, but with our parents' generation, there was no, no. There, was, there was no parents to babysit. Absolutely. Imagine so they that. were either with you by their side or you were at home with them. Yeah, they right. didn't go, you know. Absolutely. So the movie comes out in November. November the 8th. November the 8th. Yeah. Okay. And, that, and where is the screening? Right. So initially we're going to be screening it at the Genesis Cinema in Mile End. Mile End, right. Mile End Road, Whitechapel. Okay. And um, what we're doing, it again, I'm using music to celebrate it. So I've got five generations of DJs. Right. Gonna, instead of seeing um, trailers at the beginning, you're just going to be entertained by these generations of DJs. Okay. And then we're going to watch the two films, because there's two films we're showing, Six Man and Yes Man. Now, Yes Man is a film, and I have to talk about Daniel, because without Daniel, this would never happen. Right. Now, Daniel is 32 years old now. I met him when he was 29. And I met him at a film festival. And I said, I'm here because I'm looking for someone to direct my movie. And um, and I need he needs to be young and he needs to be black. So he fit that criteria. And I said to him, can you do this? And he says, yes, I can. He says, I'm making my own movie now as we speak. Right. So the first thing I did with him was the documentary Young, Gifted and Black. Okay. And then after he did that, then he completed his own movie please let me um, do a film premiere for you and let me do it street sound style and he said he didn't understand it I said our people have got to know and celebrate what you've done because right. there's not enough celebration for what the young youths are doing you know I mean every time you see something you don't realise no, that's a young man, a young black man. You know what I mean? Every time they portray black man or young black men, they have footballers. I have nothing against sports um, or an artist, and I have nothing against the music. But we also have film directors. We have school yeah. teachers. We, have, we cover every aspect of what the world needs today. We are there now, and we are there, and we're very good at it. So originally, it was really to, to celebrate his movie. And, right. then, um, and then in the interim, I gave him the six-man story, and I said, look, I want to do this. And boom, he says, all right, I can make this movie within this time. Do you want to do it? So I said, of course I want to do it. And then at yeah, the end of it, he said to me, well, now nah, you've got a film to premiere, so you can premiere your own movie. And I said, no, 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 no. It would be a total injustice if I only just do my movie and not do your movie. Right. So, um, and that's the reason why we've got two movies premiering on the same day. And so it's going to be a long night, that premiere. Sound well, systems in the beginning and then two movies. And you know those sound systems are going to be playing after. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so you have to just block the whole day out. <laughs> well, you know, we definitely have the whole evening. We have it till just after 12. Well, we have it till, we actually officially have it till 2 o'clock. But right. I know people have a cool thing to do in the morning. So 
We know the young ones are going to rave it out, but us big people will just about manage to watch the movie and get the first one-to-one, five-generation one-to-one um, clash. And, and it kicks off at what time? So the doors open at 7, program starts okay. at 8.30. Okay. And how long is each film? Right, so the six-one movie is 40 minutes. Right. And the Yes Man is just over an hour. Okay, right. So okay. The, hopefully, not hopefully, the two movies will be riveting enough to keep your attention. And then I'll, I have every confidence that they will be absolutely riveting. Right. You and know, with it's that, even if nothing else, but from a historical point of view, what was going on in the scene, but a genuine story being told by somebody who was actually doing it and, and there, as opposed to somebody who was asleep on the bed in the cults. Do you know what I mean? It's a, a slightly different um, scenario. Yeah, you were running up and down the road with the acetate in your hand and yada, 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 you know what I mean? So I think it might be a slightly different take. But um, yeah. it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, sir. So just recap on all the information so the viewers and listeners can can get it all, because it's better to come from you. I'll never remember it. So, okay. So let me say, so on Saturday the 8th of November, it's going to be the grand premiere, red carpet affair of the two movies, the Anthony Bradley Sticksman story and the Yes Man, produced by Daniel Bovar. Now, this young man is an exciting future He's, 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 he's just excited. He's made the two movies and his mind is amazing. And we're going to have a question and answer session, which will be hosted by DJ Lane. And then we have a musical showdown. <laughs> Benson Law, that's the youngest, coming up with Sir DJ Corey, Super D, Heartless Crew, Good Groove, and the Sounds of Sir George International. All lumped together. Okay. One for one. So you personally will be abs- abs- actually will spinning? Be dropping that record down. <laughs> As you say, you can't take it out of the man, right? That's that's the roots. That's where you started. All with the sound system. And that's where everything comes from, you know? That's right. That's where everything and, comes from. And the thing about it, and we will be showing... You know, I mean, our respect because we've lost people along the way, and um, and we yes. were also recognizing Russell Roy, who sang Six Man, um, David Fergus, who was also one of the members of the Sir George Band, um, Sir George Sound, and also my mom and dad, who were the first investors in me that believed that I could do. And, you know, I mean, my dad, George Brightly, it was his sound system, and that's why I always kept it at St. George. My yeah. mom ran the club, you know what I mean? And between the two of them, they've made me who I am today. So ultimately, They gave you the foundation for you to become who you are now. It's, all the way. And as they say, there's no accounting for great having great parents, and yeah. you only know it when you were fortunate enough to have it. Absolutely, yeah. and you know that. You're saying that because you know that. Uh, well, yeah, well, I didn't want to say, I didn't want to blow their trumpet, but yes, you know, I had um, or have omnipresent parents, a mother who is approaching 97 and, and still got the mouth going and got the fight and all the face in it. And, you know, that's what's keeping her going. But yeah, you know, I had great parents and yes, I understand I, perfectly what you mean. And I, and I think it's, it's you know, I mean... I say it for my parents, but I talk on the behalf of all the people of our age. Some of us have lost our parents. Some of us still have them. Yeah. But, you know what I mean? We talk about the ring rush without even recognizing really what those young people did. They left home, left their families, left everything, and came to a country and started with just a te- Some of them just had a telephone number. Some of them just had an address. Yeah, absolutely. Just an address. And, and, you know, I think it really is 
representative of the fight that they had in them. And as I said, my mother at 90, approaching 97 has still got that fight, but it's what they had to go through to survive. And fortunately she had a profession and, but still those barriers and that ceiling was there. Those, the discrimination was there and you constantly had to be fighting yeah. to, you know, to maintain your position, shall we say. As we say, for our parents, it was as clear as daylight. It was the sign was on the wall. Or yeah. they see a black man driving a nice car, they'll drag him out and say, you're not supposed to do that. They will steal your goods and, and, and you don't get paid by the insurance. And I'm not saying that as stories. I'm still talking about things that I see with my own father. My dad had two lorries. They stole them. The insurance company made him bankrupt. You know what I mean? You know, he was driving his car. Man stopped him, pulled him out of his car. You're, like, you're talking about things that people did. And it's yeah. not recorded. And it's not that we want to hash up things. But we want to talk about what, what it is that makes us the great people that we are. Because we are great. Absolutely. I mean, I say it all the time. It's like whichever arena in life that you look at once we decide that we are going to partake and participate we will partake and participate and surpass that's right we will set and that is with the foot in your neck that is with the foot in your neck so you then stop and think well what are the possibilities what is the potential that could be reached if you were just given a fair crack of the whip you know But um, as I said, it's lovely to talk to you. This is where we are, and um, and I'm I'm proud that we are here, that we can talk. Absolutely. And set the record. It's not about setting the record straight. We're actually setting the records and putting them in place. Yeah. Because there's many records. Because a lot of these stories have not been told. That's the thing, and that's the whole purpose of the In Conversation series that I've created. It's various people telling their stories, but I think these stories need to be told. They need to be told by the people themselves, not narrated by somebody else. And they need to be told to somebody who is empathic, who is involved and emotionally and financially involved in the whole journey because your vision and sight of what it is and what it means is completely different from somebody who just is a journalist who looks up Black Slate on Google and then comes and starts asking you questions. That's right. <laughs> you and, I think that's right. and I think for where we are and what we're doing now, um, it's not just for the UK, it's actually for the world. Yeah. Because young people in Africa, young people in the Caribbean, when they see this and they hear about it, they can actually, they can trace back and find the gap. Yeah. They'll be physically trace back and say, oh, so that is why between the 40s and the 70s or the 80s, there was a lull in the Caribbean and the Caribbean was dependent on just tourism and became a service country as opposed to becoming a country that provided and created their own wealth. Yeah, you know, because as they say, it was literally the brain drain. So all of the people who had the brain to carry on a business and to to develop an industry left. They left the country. So you had those that were maids and etc. Menial work, or well, what else could they do? You know, work in a hotel. Right. And, and you know, you try to that. explain to people that. The Caribbean you visit now is a very different Caribbean from the Caribbean that our parents grew up in because they were British subjects. So, you know, they were private beaches and things that they couldn't even go on in their own country. So you have to really realize that where we are going, where we go to visit now in 2020, 2021, 22 is not where our parents were in 1944 or 1950. That's right. And
Well, it seems that we've had technical difficulties at his end. Um, internet, that's what happens. So thank you for joining us and see you next time. Are you connected, Rack? I'm connected. Was it you or me? I believe it would be my internet. Because you, know, you froze completely. You right. froze completely. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm there trying to have a conversation and there's you just going. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, I'll just finish off by just saying is um, our parents, that, or the parents that was left behind in the Caribbean, they ended up trying to educate their children. And without even realizing, they, in, they, they continued the brain drain yeah. by educating the children locally and then send them away. Sending them away, yeah. And they didn't come back because what they were accustomed to in the Caribbean or what their new life was with their new education kept them in the States or kept them in England or Canada. And it's only now, only now in the Caribbean people are realizing, I'm not sending my children away to go to Northern. We have universities right here in the Caribbean. Well, yeah, you know, but again, you know, talking about our parents' time, they didn't have a University of the West Indies that they have now with right. sites in, in Trinidad, Barbados, and Jamaica. They didn't have it. So, Antigua now. Oh, and it's in Antigua as well. Okay. You see, they didn't have that. You So for that, to attain that further education, you had to go out. You had to get out. And, you know, the opportunities were limited. That's why it's so relevant and important to pay them the respect they deserve. Because you have to accept that where they were growing up was not where you visit now. And there weren't the opportunities that they were or there are now. You didn't have people from Barbados or Jamaica that looked like you and I working in a bank, working in a chemist. Absolutely. So, you know, if you had a brain and you, you thought, well, yes, I want to do more than I can achieve here. That was part of the reason why a lot of people left, because they thought, well, you know, I want to do more and I know there's more I can do, but my options are limited here. There's, you know, so they had to get out. And that's exactly, the, and that was it. That was the reason yeah. why. But now, fortunately, we we have our own private hospitals. We have our own local hospitals. We have doctors. We have the laboratories. We, we, we have everything now. Yeah. Which is so beautiful. And so you can go and study to be a vet, a veterinarian, and come back to your country and... Get work. And have a position. Yeah. 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 Or set up your own, uh, what, you know what I mean? And that is what, that's where we are now. It's taken 50, 60 years to get there. But, but as they say, better late than never. So, you know, people like you are movers and shakers and are moving things forward and telling the story. And that's exactly what we need. So, really, I can only say thank you so much and wish you every success with the movie. And of course, you know, I will be there. <laughs> you've got to be there. You can't be, you, it's history in the making. You've got to be there. Yeah, I've got to be there. You know that. So I look forward to seeing you back in the UK when you leave beautiful, sunny, warm Antigua. Yeah, you can laugh. You can laugh. Okay, you can laugh. <laughs> Anthony, you take care. It's been an absolute pleasure. And 